Welcome back, everyone. Thank you for joining me again. I'm Janice Degnito Ellis. I'm the Senior Book and Paper Conservator at the National Museum of American History. And I'm honored to talk to you about a now 10-year-old conservation project. I can't believe it's been 10 years. The Conservation of the Jefferson Bible at the National Museum of American History. Um, we affectionately called this project the Star Spangled Banner in miniature because it was uh, just as important to the museum and just as uh, complex. Uh, before I start with the presentation, I'm gonna point you towards two things. Uh, there is a Smithsonian uh, Press facsimile edition of the Jefferson Bible that I'll talk about in the presentation. This is available anywhere from Amazon to the Smithsonian. Um, and um, it's interesting also because it's, Actually, we took great pains. It's the same size, the same color. We copied the tooling, and it is a um, fabulous printing of the digital images of the actual artifact. So that's something to um, consider if you really want to get a good look at the Jefferson Bible and read it in, in your own home. Um, I'll point you to the acknowledgments page. There are two full pages of acknowledgments. This project was massive and many, many people uh, contributed to it. And I thank them all, but unfortunately I can't name everyone in individually. Uh, the other thing to point you to is um, the discussion talks about a, um, a documentary that was made of the artifact and the project that is also available on uh, through the Smithsonian Channel. And without much further ado, We'll go into the presentation about uh, the conservation project. And uh, immediately afterwards, I will look at the Q&A and um, answer whatever questions you have. Thank you, I hope you enjoy it. In 1886, Cyrus Adler discovered two cut up copies of the New Testament in a private library in Baltimore. A catalog note inside the front cover stated that Thomas Jefferson had used these volumes to create an original book. Nine years later, in 1895, as a librarian at the Smithsonian, Adler found that book with Jefferson's great-granddaughter and purchased it for the Smithsonian for $400. That year, he included The Life and Morals of Jesus of Nazareth in an exhibition where it was displayed under the title Jefferson's Bible. It has been referred to as the Jefferson Bible ever since. The Life and Morals of Jesus of Nazareth was made by Thomas Jefferson between the years 1819 and 1820. For political and personal reasons, he kept it private throughout his lifetime. It's an 86-page assemblage of cut-out New Testament passages removed from the Gospels and glued to paper. The Gospel verses are arranged in four columns across each page spread, each column showing the same verse in a different language, from right to left, in English, French, Latin, and Greek. It's a chronologically arranged story of Jesus' life and teachings, viewed through the lens of the Enlightenment, that is, without miracles, without angels and saints, and without a resurrection. In 1902, Congress authorized the Government Printing Office to produce 9,000 facsimile copies of the Jefferson Bible for the House and the Senate. The House supply ran out quickly, but a facsimile was given to each newly elected senator on the day he swore his oath of office until the 1950s when that supply ran out too. These original glass plate negatives to produce these black and white images are also at the Smithsonian. Thomas Jefferson did all the cutting and pasting himself. His handwork within the life and morals of Jesus of Nazareth is comprised of 43 folios, each a single sheet of paper folded in half to produce two leaves. He sent the completed folios to Frederick Mayo, his last bookbinder, to be bound. Frederick Mayo glued 
62 V-shaped paper stubs around the folded edge of the 43 folios to add thickness at the spine to match the thickness at the center where the verses had been glued to the front and back of each page. He also added six end leaves. He sewed the book three up on four recessed cords and sewed on silk end bands with a double thickness of thread. He lined the spine in heavy paper and covered the volume tight back in full Morocco and added gold tooling. With age, Jefferson's paper became inflexible. The rigid spine linings and glued on stubs did not allow the paper to fully open. The pages hinged just beyond the stub line and cracked. An examination in 2005 concluded that the book could not be used without risking further damage. The artifact became inaccessible. After securing funding, a conservation team was assembled in September 2010. The team's first task was to examine the mechanics of the book, and they created a sewing map of the book structure to see whether Mayo had created a blank book and Jefferson had cut out pages to create stubs. If so, modifying the book stubs would not be considered. But conservators confirmed that this was not the case. The next tasks were more complex. Conservators completed a survey of the artifact in order to quantify its damage. They did material analysis to determine its compositional elements and to establish a baseline to monitor its aging characteristics. There's more to Jefferson's book than meets the eye. It contains 12 different types of paper, six different printing inks, four different iron gall inks, and two different adhesives, in addition to the leather, silk thread, and linen thread of the binding. The team assembled research, produced a glossary of terminology, researched material standards against which the artifacts could be measured over time, and designed a custom survey database which includes 200 data points for each page. To minimize damage, the survey was performed with a book only open to 30 degrees. The conservators worked in teams of two. One conservator served as the primary examiner while the second confirmed observations and input the data into the computer. Pages were examined in ambient, raking, transmitted, and ultraviolet illumination. A 50x microscope was used to observe the iron gall ink characteristics. As for physical damage, the survey results indicated that 98% of the pages had torn. 67% had torn at the top and bottom, the head and tail, of the stub line. 56% showed cracks in the center right along the stub line. An additional 69% of the pages had losses. A significant number of the thousand plus attachments were partially detached. There was a clear need for physical stabilization of the artifact. By contrast, the iron gall inks were in fairly good condition. Only 8% of the inks suffered from cracks, less than 7% had losses, and there were no instances of complete burn through. This did not present a clear need for chemical stabilization of the iron gall inks. Locations for material analysis of paper fibers, adhesives, and inks were chosen with the curator. Areas selected did not contain any Jeffersonian features. For example, an unintentional ink splatter was a viable sample location, whereas a period or a dotted I were not. About the material testing, here's what we did and did not do. Both the curator and the conservators did not want paper surface pH readings taken because of the risk of creating tide lines on the paper. 
cold water extraction or degree of polymerization tests were not possible due to the required sample size. Micro XRF revealed the presence of iron, aluminum, potassium, sulfur, and copper, all in the paper. NIR testing on 118 locations determined that the average surface gelatin content was 3.2%. FTIR revealed that the adhesive was a combination of protein and starch. The results of this and other testing in conjunction with our in-depth survey revealed that there was no solvent modified aqueous bath which could benefit all the materials. Conservators and curators agreed that the risks of aqueous treatment outweighed the benefits, so plans were made for anoxic long-term storage to address the chemical instability instead. After nearly six months of study, a plan was agreed upon. Separate the Jefferson pages from the Mayo binding, keep the leather binding absolutely intact, remove the damaging stubs and preserve them separately, mend the Jefferson pages, take high resolution digital images of the disbound pages and create new, more flexible stubs. Resew the book through the original sewing holes and recase the book back into its original cover. The curator recognized that Jefferson's Bible was actually two masterpieces. Frederick Mayo's binding and Jefferson's work. But of the two, Jefferson's work was the more important. Since the binding was clearly damaging the Jefferson document within, Mayo's work would have to be altered in order to stabilize Jefferson's. Because Frederick Mayo's binding would cease to be an object of study once treatment on the Jefferson Bible began, a massive amount of pretreatment documentation was carried out. Conservators examined other Mayo bindings at the University of Virginia and found that they were constructed in the exact same manner. Sewn on four recessed cords, sewn three up, double thread end bands, and the same number of tie downs. These examples of Mayo's work combined with our thorough documentation could serve future scholars of colonial bookbinding. The curator and the museum wanted everything to change about how the Jefferson Bible functioned, but we wanted nothing to change about how it looked. Step one in the treatment was removing Jefferson's handwritten four-page index, which at some point in time had been sloppily glued into the Stormont-patterned marble flyleaf. The index had previously been partially pulled out and re-glued, causing numerous delaminated areas on the surface of the marble paper. The index was also previously repaired in situ. With the front book cover supported in an open position, the conservator used a microspatula to gently remove the animal glue and release the paper. Next, the text block was tightly wrapped in a protective layer of mylar and saran, and the leather was faced overall with kizukishi paper lightly coated with Clucel G adhesive. A single scalpel cut was made to the marble paper near the edge of the board. Ethanol and methyl cellulose were applied below the cut and the marble paper was gently separated and peeled downward to the hinge to reveal the four cords, which were then cut even with the board with a scalpel. The cover was separated from the text block, leaving the bulk of the heavyweight lining paper adhere to the inside of the leather spine to support it from the inside. Working simultaneously on the front and back towards the middle of the text block, the leather cover was removed in one piece. It was stored separately, wrapped around a support for future use. Methyl cellulose was applied to the spine of the text block to soften the adhesive. The remaining lining paper was cleaned away, revealing the book sewing, the silk end band tie downs, and the folded edges of the stubs. The silk end bands were separated from the text block intact. 
Each tie down was cut near the kettle stitch and a new linen thread was tied to the end of the silk using a weaver's knot. When each tie down was secured, the end bands were gently lifted off the text block and placed into protective enclosures so they could be reused later. The book was opened to the center of each folio. The sewing threads were cut and the text block was separated into the original 43 folios with their associated glued on stubs. Because all the folios show significant planar distortion, the protective enclosures designed to house them were sink mats so that there would be no danger of crushing the pages when the enclosures were stacked for storage and placed in the vault every evening. Each folio received digital before treatment photography. Then, ethanol and methyl cellulose were applied to the glued on stubs to soften the adhesive, enabling them to be lifted off the paper with Teflon spatulas. Research on the watermarks on the stubs confirmed the manufacture date between 1819 and 1820. After the stubs were removed, each folio was photographed again in ambient light, raking light, and ultraviolet light. Copies of the photos were printed on acid-free paper. Conservators and curators examined each Jefferson page together, discussing damage, where mends needed to be made, how the mends would be made, and where evidence of Jefferson's hand would preclude treatment intervention. They made notes on the printouts and signed them as treatment authorization documents. Mending kits were made for every conservator. Each contained a variety of Japanese kozo fibered mending papers that were toned with acrylic paint to match the colors of the artifact. The lightest paper, Berlin tissue, was also coated with an adhesive, Clusel G, that could be applied to the artifact with acetone and solvent set to the tears nearest the iron gall ink where water could be a problem. Wheat starch paste was used for the remaining mends. When the mends were completed, any Japanese paper extending over the edges of the document were trimmed under a microscope using a scalpel, carefully following the original contour of the artifact. The overarching goal of the treatment was to keep the same look and the same feel of this early 19th century object. Dog-eared mens were unfolded and secured, but losses were not infilled. The mens were there to stabilize the pages, not improve the appearance or take away any of Jefferson's touch. The final digital photography of the mended folios was done with a 50 megapixel Hasselblad camera that produced as much digital clarity as a microscope. Conservators carefully removed dust from the surface before photography and examined the images afterwards for quality control. New stubs were made from Kizukishi Japanese paper, which was toned to match the Jefferson paper. Two new stubs were made for each folio, one for inside and one for outside the fold, therefore protecting the Jefferson folios from both the sewing threads and the spine adhesive. A sewing tray was made to the exact height of the original bound text block. The rebound book would need to be this exact height or the original covers would no longer fit it. But with new sewing thread and stubs, this was a tricky task. The tray provided a constant visual and tactile reminder of how much to compact the sewing and the paper as the rebinding progressed. The tray also provided protection to the page edges as the book was sewn and kept them perfectly aligned during re-sewing. The folios were sewn all along, unsupported, with 35-3 unbleached linen thread. The re-sewn text block was lined with two layers of Japanese tissue before the original silk end bands were re-sewn back into place in their original locations. The spine was lined with additional layers of Japanese paper until the book could be opened without the spine throwing upwards. The book was opened 
and paged through several times, observing how the paper moved and making new page repairs in areas which were determined may need additional support. To prepare for recasing the book in its original covers, the marble paper paste downs were lifted from the front and back covering boards using ethanol, methylcellulose, and a Teflon lifting spatula. The leather spine was supported from the inside with layers of Japanese paper. The uppermost layer was toned blue to assist future conservators should they too need to remove the covers from the book someday. Once it was confirmed that the re-sewn text block fit the original cover, it was re-adhered to the cover at the spine, tight back, using wheat starch paste. The Japanese paper spine lining tabs were adhered below the lifted marbled paste down papers on the covers. About one eighth of an inch of the Japanese paper lining tabs were visible inside at the hinges. This area was inpainted with dots of golden liquid acrylic paint to match the pattern of the marbled Stormont papers. Here are the after treatment photographs. Three quarter view, front, three quarter view, back. Here, a during treatment view of one of the most light damaged pages, before mending and after. Here, before and after treatment of the spine. Before and after treatment of the headband. Here, a before and after treatment view of the head of the book. Notice the softness at the head where the new stubs are, as opposed to the old. Likewise, a before and after treatment view of the tail of the book. Lastly, a before and after view of the openability of the book. Note how the paper can now drape and open more fully in the after treatment view. The book was ready for exhibition display once again. 100 years after Jefferson had cut them apart, and 25 years after Adler had found them in a private collection in Baltimore, the Cohen family donated the two English language New Testament source books to the Smithsonian. These books, referred to as Source Book One and Source Book Two, were also part of the Jefferson Bible Conservation Project. Both volumes were split through the text block, spine linings, and leather. Source Book 1 was broken twice in the first third of the volume. Source Book 2 was broken in three places. The curator suspected that these splits may have been created by Jefferson himself to aid in cutting the clippings. If this was the case, or even a possibility, he did not want the breaks in the binding repaired as this was evidence of Jefferson's hand. Although both volumes exhibited numerous cutouts, Source Book One served as Jefferson's primary resource, with at least 171 passages extracted from the first 160 pages of the volume where the four Gospels end. In Source Book Two, Jefferson removed at least 69 individual passages from the four Gospels. These passages ranged from single lines to an entire page. Jefferson frequently left behind page frames, partial page frames, and other unused passages, leaving the books in an extremely vulnerable state. After lots of brainstorming and discussion, the curator and conservator determined a plan of minimal intervention. As with the Jefferson Bible, they examined each page together and determined what to mend, what to stabilize, and what to leave alone. In general, Conservators would repair breaks in the paper that appeared to be torn from age and or use. 
areas that appeared cut or sliced with a tool were not mended, since these were most likely evidence of Jefferson's hand. Cuts which were vulnerable to further tearing were supported at the base, while leaving the actual slice unmended. Treatment notes, including the exact locations of all men's, were written directly on the curatorial approval sheets, which will remain with the permanent documentation. In accordance with the curator's wishes, no treatment was executed on the leather bindings of either source book. Tucked inside the source books were fragments that were intentionally cut by Jefferson, but not used. Other fragments appear to be broken off from age. During the mending approval process, the curator was adamant that only those fragments that appeared torn should be reattached. The remaining cut fragments were encapsulated and will reside with the object in a separate post binding. From the front paste down through the end of the Gospels, each page of the two books was photographed with a piece of photo gray paper behind it to block the view of the pages behind, which would otherwise show through the cutout gaps. This makes it easier to read. To preserve the original two source books, these photographs will be served to scholars in lieu of the objects themselves. The museum never missed the opportunity to showcase the Jefferson Bible Project to the media. The initial press release announced the conservation project on March 10, 2011. The press release announced the opening date as November 10, 2011. In the eight months between those two dates, the Paper Conservation Laboratory staff provided 47 tours, most lasting 45 minutes to an hour. Tours were hosted for the media, the entire museum staff, professional colleagues, museum donors, museum board of directors, the secretary of the Smithsonian Institution and his staff, the Smithsonian Board of Regents, and members of Congress, including the chair of the Appropriations Committee for the Smithsonian. The price for the tour was comic relief and a chance to have a photo with our team mascot. Our adorable Thomas Jefferson bobblehead, although we spared this indignity of the congressional staff. Every painstaking step of the entire conservation treatment project was filmed by the Smithsonian Network for a one hour documentary called Jefferson's Secret Bible. No matter the delicacy of the conservation treatment process, the camera crew was there to film it live, often on the tabletop. The filmmaking process was at times inconvenient and intrusive, and sometimes embarrassing. However, the end result is an amazing reveal, and it reaches an entirely new audience, shedding light not only on Jefferson and his little volume, but on the field of conservation and the importance of preserving cultural heritage. The Conservation Treatment Project also provided the opportunity for the Smithsonian Books to publish the first color facsimile of the object using the original Hasselblad images taken during treatment. The Smithsonian's edition, Jefferson Bible, contains a chapter discussing the conservation decision-making treatment as well as chapters by the curators about the history of the object. The book release date coincided with the exhibit opening and within five months was already on four printings. The images were also used by the museum to create an interactive website where visitors can view each page of the Bible and zoom in on interesting details. The website contains a page with a step-by-step -step conservation treatment and since November 2011 when the website launched, within months it had received 65,000 visits from around the world. Pictured here is the Jefferson Bible, the two source books, and the 1904 facsimile edition, all on exhibit in November 2011 at the National Museum of American History Smithsonian Institution. The Conservation Treatment Project not only renewed the book, but renewed public interest in the book.
in online media and print media, in magazine articles, in blog posts, on the television news, on radio segments, podcasts, and the full-length one-hour documentary. The amount of media attention surrounding the life and morals of Jesus of Nazareth and its conservation reflects the public's interest in Jefferson's original question, what is the moral basis for the new republic? What began as a private act for Thomas Jefferson has taken on a different meaning as a modern audience considers afresh how religion and politics mix in today's society. That realization that original artifacts are still vital and part of a contemporary dialogue help the wider audience understand the importance of preserving cultural heritage. I should point out that it is now 200 years old. Uh, this, this year is its anniversary year, and Dr. Peter Manso at the National Museum of American History has uh, published a book uh, through Princeton University Press, uh, the, great, the Lives of the Great Religious Book Series um, on the Jefferson Bible. And um, some of the documentation that we produced in this project was uh, used by him uh, to draw some of his conclusions. And speaking of conclusions, we have actually run out of time. And I see no questions in the Q&A, so I will say a fond thank you for your time and attention and enjoy your afternoon.